Hello and welcome. My name is Adam Griggs and I'm a research services librarian here at Mercer University Library. In this video, we're going to talk about online archives. Our discussion will center on the different types of online archives and we'll get familiar with the various terms used to refer to those archives. Just to narrow this down a bit more, I want to talk about the scope and objectives for this video. So our scope is primarily focused on finding primary sources for history research. However, online archives can be used for a whole lot more than just history. Um, so even if you are uh, in other disciplines or you have other objectives, this video can still be relevant to you. And our learning objectives, by the end of the video you should understand why online archives are a valuable tool, especially for finding primary sources for historical research. And because I can't show you every single archive out there, we will also discuss the various types of online archives and the terms used to refer to them. And finally, you should be able to distinguish the common features of these different types of archives. So why should you consider using online archives at all in your research? Well, archives by their nature are tasked with collecting unique and important documents and items and helping to preserve them. Usually this mission also includes allowing researchers to interact and learn from these materials. And online archives are used in the same way and they also help traditional archives to fulfill this mission. So online archives help to expand access. So the reach of any archive is limited and it has to be this way because some objects are just so unique that there's only one of them, and if you are not near that archive, you cannot view those documents. So online archives break down these geographical barriers, and researchers are no longer limited by where they live. Uh, related to this, archives serve a specific community or receive documents from particular people or organizations. In this, reg in this regard, each collection within an archive is only as complete as their donations and holdings, and most archives have gaps or missing documents. Online archives can help you to fill in these gaps by making relevant work available. So this means that you can pull primary resources from multiple online archives and get a more complete picture than you otherwise would be able to from just a single archive. Finally, a lot of archival materials are old and they are delicate and if scholars want to look at them or read them they might break them or the documents could become damaged through use in this regard online archives help with preservation because most researchers will not need to access the physical objects but they can use the digital copies okay so now i want to emphasize these points with a quick example so here we have a digitized page from a manuscript called the bosworth psalter so this manuscript, it's held in the British Library, but we can access it here in the United States, so no geographical boundaries. Additionally, if your research was about translating scripture into the local vernacular, this would be a good find since it contains written translations from Latin into Old English, written in the marginalia. And finally, the Bosworth Psalter was created in 10th century Southern England, which means that this manuscript is over a thousand years old. Uh, I don't know if I would even want to touch this if I could. So using the digitized copy will hopefully keep this around for another thousand years. Okay, so in a minute we're going to start discussing and defining various types of online archives. Uh, but before we do that, I have both some caveats and a suggestion. As for the caveats, it's really important to acknowledge that there are not always clear boundaries with the different types of online archives. The main different types of archives all do similar things. So for example, an archive that calls itself a digital library is pretty similar to an archive that calls itself a digital collection. Additionally, these are not the only types of online archives, nor is this necessarily how other people would divide up the different types. So I've selected some of the most common that I've seen to be helpful to students. However, what an archive calls itself usually represents something about their organization and priorities and how they want to be discovered. And this leads to my suggestion. So if you are looking for an on online archive in some kind of uh, search engine like Google or uh, other search engine, try using a variety of these search terms that we'll discuss in your search. There might be multiple types of archives out there with primary source documents relevant to your specific history research. Okay, so now on to the types of online archives. We're actually going to look at six, and these are in no particular order. Um, but first up, we have digital archive, digital collection, and digital library. Now, if something is labeled a digital archive, it probably has a strong preservation aspect to it with a focus on primary sources, and it's also typically divided into thematic collections. I would say that very few resources actually have the term digital archive in their name, usually preferring the bigger umbrella term um, digital collection. 
uh, but there are definitely some out there. And these are usually just the online digitally scanned materials of an already existing archive. So really quick, let's look at this page from the Washington State Archives. Here's a map of school districts from Spokane County from 1927. So this is the Washington State Archives. So it makes sense that they would have this kind of document, this map. Um, and if we look at the rest of the website, we can see some other common features that other uh, archives have. So uh, let's go to collections and then the record series. Now, each of these series is a thematic collection. And this is a government database, so you can kind of see how each of these would relate to government records of some sort. Um, so let's actually look at the collection Frontier Justice, and we'll stick with Spokane County. So Spokane Frontier Justice. So right here, it tells you a little bit about what this is. And so this is the Guide to the Court Records of Washington Territory. is a name index, an abstract of more than 38,000 district court cases. Um, so again, very important uh, primary source documents. It gives, shows you the year range in here. Now, this is another common feature you see is that it's asking us to search, right? It's a name index, but we can also browse the series. Um, and if we do that, we'll notice again that a lot of these are not actually digitized in the far right column says um, NA. Um, and digitizing takes a lot of time and money and even if you can't get it online, sometimes you can get a sense of the archives holdings. And in this case, we can not actually click on a record and learn more about it, um, but we can't actually get the, the image itself. Okay, let's go back and look at some more definitions. The next on the list is digital collection. Uh, I mentioned this before, but digital collection has become something of a catch-all term for any kind of thematic collection of digitized materials. So these can be museum-like materials, manuscripts, books, images, basically anything that constitutes a collection. This is the, probably the most common term that you will see used. Um, and let's go to this example here from the New York Public Library Digital Collections. Okay, so I've selected a digital collection from the New York Public Library Digital Collections called the Early American Manuscripts Project. Now this is itself a large collection of early American writers that are further subdivided into their own collections based off of the important historical figure associated with them. So whether they received the letters or, or wrote them. Um, so to actually get to the items themselves, you have to go into one of these sub collections. So let's look at this letter from James Madison written to Edmund Pendleton from April 9th, 1782. Now Edmund Pendleton, he was a Virginia representative at the first Continental Congress. Okay, so here we have the scan of the document itself. So it looks a bit small, so what we can do is we have a lot of tools here to help us read it, so we can zoom in. Uh, we can even go to the back and let's zoom in again. And you can see here we have some writing, so we can even rotate this. There we go. So we can read that. So James Madison to Edmund Pendleton. And then below it, I do want to draw attention again to how it's organized. So we actually found this through the Early American Manuscripts Project. But you'll notice that the James Madison papers are also part of other collections. Um, and so there might be a way to find more things there. So for example, there's more letters to Edmund Pendleton. Um, and then there's also all this information that can help you contextualize um, the item itself. Um, and it even ends with a right statement and a timeline of events from the creation of the letter to when it was digitized to when you found it. Um, okay, so let's go back and we'll talk about digital libraries. Digital libraries, they are exactly what you think they are. So these are really focused on usage and accessibility like a typical library. Um, they're also mainly focused on the printed work, which can be primary, secondary, or even tertiary resources. It really just depends on what the library has in its holdings. Um, and here, let's look at one of my favorite digital libraries, the Hathi Trust. Okay, so here's a document that I've found beforehand. Um, now this is a scan of an official government document on a hearing before the House of Representatives on various communist and anarchist deportation cases from 1920. Now, the first thing I'd like to point out is that this actually looks a lot like our library records, the ones that you would see in Mercer's own library search. 
And again, this is by design. Um, so the Hathi Trust is the digital library and they use searches that are similar to a library. So you'll, you'll see things like the author and then you have subject headings that can help you find more things on this topic. And actually, if you go to uh, the advanced catalog search, you'll see it even looks a lot more like our library search where it uses different search terms and you can um, filter these the way that you need. Okay, let's go back to the document though. Now to see the whole item, uh, you wanna click on where it says full view. So, and here are the scans of the book itself. So you should see some differences between these scans and the ones at the New York Public Library. So since this is a digital library, it is focused on use and readability. And so in that regard, the scans are more geared toward capturing text, right? So the, the one that we looked at from the New York Public Library, it had handwriting and it was like a photograph. This one has been scanned to really highlight the, the contrast so you can read text a lot better. Um, and one of the tools that they have is you can actually read the text only view of this item. So um, the font will actually be in more modern day fonts. So you can see it down here at the bottom and then you can kind of navigate this way. So, so again, it's, it's got tools in there to make it more readable so that you can access the information more clearly and, and potentially search for the things that you want. Okay, so let's go back and we'll talk about three more types of archives. All right, let's move on to the next archive types. So now on this slide, we have institutional repository, digital humanities, and scholarly databases. And institutional repository is really just a platform for storing, maintaining, accessing, and preserving digital or digitized objects. Um, but what makes these different is that they're usually on a smaller scale, just the institutional level. So for example, a local historical group might have its own institutional repository. Also, universities usually have their own institutional repositories. So actually, let's take a look at Mercer's own repository. It's called URSA. All right, so here is an item on URSA, and URSA stands for Mercer University Research Scholarship and Archives. So this is a yearbook, uh, The Cauldron from 1984, and you kind of get a look at the 80s hair and outfits. Um, yeah, great. So yeah, so it's college yearbook. So if you look here, you'll find some information about it. Now, if we go to the communities and collections and kind of see what else we have, you'll really notice that this is extremely Mercer focused. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's really highly localized and institutional repositories are like that, right? So um, they're, they're just super local to the organization that is maintaining them. It's where they put the things. So here we have things all related to to Mercer, we can have research by faculty and, and students, um, and we even have some university partners on here. Um, and so just to kind of give you an idea of the things, the primary sources that would be in an institutional repository, they are extremely relevant um, to you know, Mercer as an institution, um, but unless your research involves Mercer in some way, they might not be as relevant. So um, if you do have an organization that you are researching, um, maybe take a look and see if they have an institutional repository or a place that they're putting um, their archival materials. Okay, great. Let's go back and we will uh, look at um, some projects in digital humanities. Okay, so for the next one, it's digital humanities and very few projects will actually have the term digital humanities in the title. Um, as this is more of a research discipline that's really expanding its reach in a whole variety of subjects. So very briefly, digital humanities are research projects by humanities scholars that use data and digital tools to present and interpret primary sources. So they are not just giving you the primary source, but they are reforming the way that we engage with those primary sources. Again, these are just broad strokes and there are many ways um, to do digital humanities and there are many types of project out there. Um, but specifically for this video, I picked a historical project to look at as an example called Equiano's World. Okay, so this website, Equiano's World, uh, it was named after Olauda Equiano, who was a freed slave living in London, and he was actually renamed Gustavus Vasa by a slave owner, and he, and he used that name throughout his life. But he wrote an account of his life called The Interesting Narrative of Alauda Equiano or Gustavus Vasa the African, which was published in 1789. And this uh, detailed really the horrors of slavery and helped to abolish the, the slave trade in England. So 
Again, this is a very important book. Um, and so this website is dedicated to the study of that book. So we actually have the primary sources here, right? We have a number of editions uh, um, and, you know, you can actually read the book itself, but it has a whole lot more, right? So we have articles about the context. We can actually look at um, the travels of Basa. We can look at, you know, his life events, the timeline of things that happened in the book. We can look at the associates mentioned in the book, but also questions that are raised by the book, right? So um, it's not just that it is giving you the primary source, but it's giving you all this other information at, uh, at the same time. And that's really what digital humanities is doing. It's really hopefully contextualizing the information or making it so you can engage with it in a different way alongside with the primary source documents. Okay, um, so let's go back and look at the final archive I wanna talk about. And it's one that I think you'll be familiar with as we're gonna talk about scholarly databases. I put scholarly databases on this list mainly because it is not what comes to mind when students think about online archives. This is because many scholarly databases uh, are meant to find secondary sources, historical well-researched papers from academics or you know, other interpretive texts. However, there are databases that are only for historical primary sources, and we actually have a few of those here at Mercer. And let's look at this one from the American Antiquarian Society. Okay, now this is a resource that Mercer subscribes to, and so that means that you will have to go through the library's website to access it. And this database in particular is focused on early periodicals in America, so primary sources the exact years are between 1691 and 1820. And again, a periodical is any publication that comes out periodically. So this contains tracts, newspapers, magazines, etc., from the colonial period through the founding of the United States. Um, one thing I will say about scholarly databases is that they really tend to be harder to browse. And this is using a similar search format as a traditional scholarly database would use. And so we have to start off with some keyword searches. So I'm actually just gonna start off with um, the word Georgia. Let's see what we can find. Okay, so we have 472 results, and you'll notice these are sorted by date oldest. So we have the oldest results first, and then we have this one from February 1731. And it's the rise of the colony of Georgia. And we can see where it was originally published. So the source is Gentleman's Magazine or Monthly Intelligencer. All right, so this is, is a really interesting article because this was actually uh, published and written prior to the trustees of Georgia being granted a royal charter. And you can see that in the article itself, right? It says, Rise of the Colony of Georgia, a true account of a new colony about to be established in America by several noblemen, gentlemen, and merchants. So they're actually vying for this royal charter. charter. All right, so all the images in this database, they are all text readable. So you notice it highlighted where it found our search term. Um, but um, you cannot necessarily find them in more modern texts, right? So there's some, uh, they have long S's in here. So some of these might be a little bit more difficult to read, but you can download them all via PDF if you find something that you're interested in. Okay, so that sums up scholarly databases. Let's go back to the slideshow and we'll um, finish up with a short discussion of some other relevant important terms. Now I want to speak briefly about a few other terms that you'll come across when looking for online archives. Uh, the first term is memory institutions. So knowing what kind of memory institutions are out there can really help in your search for primary source documents. This is because memory institutions are any organization dedicated to preserving and documenting our collective past. And doing so goes well beyond traditional archives and libraries, but it can include museums, historical societies, hobbyists, nonprofit collectors, etc. cetera. Um, more often than not, you will need to do research on who has what primary sources and then search for that particular group's digital archive. However, there are some archives out there that do a really good job at collecting a lot of resources in one place. And I want to show you just one more example of an online archive that takes from a whole lot of different memory institutions, and it's called Europeana. Okay, now Europeana is designed to make it easier for EU member nations to share their cultural heritage. 
So the way this works is that you have multiple memory institutions from all across Europe, and they can all combine their digital archives into this single platform. And so if we come down here to where it says all institutions, we can see that we're actually talking about hundreds of different archives and uh, memory institutions. Um, and literally millions of items are, have been digitized and put into this platform. And so what this does is it expands the reach of each of those archives because everything is findable in the same platform. So for example, if we come down here to newspapers, we can see that they actually have over 4 million newspapers from all across Europe. And they have some helpful tools here. So you can look at titles, they have special exhibits. Um, but then we can also just browse um, these 4 million newspapers. And you can see, again, that you can search by date and that you can also look at the different languages or the providing countries. And so what you can do with this is you can actually pick, you know, a historical event or a time period and you can see what's happening in Europe in multiple newspapers from all across the continent. Uh, you might have to be able to speak those languages, but essentially what you're doing is getting a broader picture of the continent as a whole, as opposed to just in a single localized spot. And that's mainly because these are all in the same platform and we can search them all around the same time. Okay, so uh, that's it for Europeana. Let's go back and we'll finish up our discussion of a few more archival terms. Okay, next is the online exhibit slash gallery. So this is a pretty general term and you probably saw this pop up in Europeana when we were just looking at it. Um, but these tend to skew more towards a museum experience. They're often visual curated collections on a certain theme. This makes them very good for displaying artworks and museum holdings, um, but they can also be for important documents or collection highlights. It really just depends on the organization. And finally, I want to talk a bit about what are called finding aids. Now, finding aids are how every archive catalogs their holdings. So even if you find an archive and they don't have a lot of digital materials online, you'll probably still be looking through an online finding aid of some kind to see what they have. And this is because archives get boxes full of things and when they process the archive uh, or collection, they make a guide that lists all the contents of the collection. And these are really important for finding relevant documents um, that are contained within a particular archive. Also, these are often tied up with their digital collection. So many finding aids will let you know what materials have been digitized and which ones you can access. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Uh, this last slide is, is a list of the resources that I highlighted in the video and their links. And I hope that this video is helpful to you in your search for primary sources. And if you ever need assistance finding any primary sources, please come ask a librarian. Thanks for watching.